We're going to, to go ahead and uh, start our program, but good morning to everyone. What a wonderful start last night to the uh, festivities here this weekend with Father G. Father, thank you very much for a wonderful celebration at Mass last night. As we begin all of our meetings, let us say our Sarah prayer for vocations. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who wills not the death of a sinner, but rather that he be converted and live, grant we beseech you through the intercession of the Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Yenipra Sarah, and all the saints, an increase of labors for your church, fellow laborers with Christ to spin and consume themselves for souls, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning we have some opening remarks from our own Episcopal advisor, Cardinal Collins. The uh, Cardinal Collins is in Rome right now, so we had difficulty matching up with a uh, welcome, but we did, we do have a video here that we would like to show before uh, we move forward. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, wonderful. So um, we will have remarks from Cardinal Collins, as Tim mentioned, he is in Rome. That video has not been sent, but we do have a video that was prepared um, really highlighting the importance of Sarah and why we're here. So here are some leaders of the church at various levels talking about Sarah, including Cardinal Collins. I am privileged to be the executive director of NCDP, which is, in fact, as Rick said, uh, tasked with the ongoing formation and training of the diocesan vocation directors. But equally important to us is also their continual spiritual formation, uh, which is why Sarah, right from the get-go, is so important to uh, partnering with NCDB. For a number of years now, um, through the gift of fellow Sarahs and yourself, we have been able to offer at our annual conference each year all-day adoration. One of the joys of life is to be engaged with Sarah because Sarah. The work you do, the prayer you offer, is so wonderful. For me, it's a great privilege to spend this time of faith and reflection with you and to give you my support, my grateful support for the tremendous mission that you provide for the church. Um, I'd like you to be grace led. where your presence may not always be prominent, but its effect is everywhere in the life of the church. As you pray for our good, holy, healthy vocations for the Christian and support us in areas in so many concrete and important ways, and quite frankly, to pray for those already ordained that they remain good, holy, healthy, joyful men of faith. The beauty of Sarah's and Sarah Spark, particularly, and NCBD, some might say, well, does our partnership really make a difference? Yes, it does really. A difference. That man doesn't get to lay prostrate on the ground on the cathedral floor without the help of Sarah. I'm saying this because what you do and how you support your local priests is so monumental. And the financial support, yeah, that comes a long way, especially for our priests and mission guides. All right? Uh, the work that uh, Sarah Foundation has done with NCBD as a overarching organization, the resources that we have put out, the booklets that we have put out, we would not, we would not have been, listen to me, we would not have been able to do it without your help. The prayerful support, the fraternal support, that all goes into it. The Sarah Spark Initiative in recent history is one of the single most important things that Sarah has offered to Catholic Church. Why? You are helping them who stay in this ministry for approximately five years before the next guy comes through the revolving door and has to learn about vocation all over again, how not to reinvest in the 
You're giving them the tools that you not only know by heart because of your program. St. Benedict says uh, in the beginning there in, in his rule, for every good work you begin, you get with prayer. And so prayer is the foundation of all that we do uh, as uh, people uh, seeking to foster vocations. That's the one piece of instruction the Lord gave to us. Pray to the Lord in the harvest, to send labors into the harvest. So always not only in our own life, our own mission, as Sarah, but also in everything we do that's engaged with, uh, with vocations, uh, we need to be very, very much committed to life and prayer. Pray that our seminarians, our priests, our bishops, Pray that they will accept the offer to be true friends with the Lord Jesus. Pray for seminarians who are seeking a holy, healthy life by seeking true friendship, divine friendship with Jesus. We need priests. We need the ceremony. What we need, we can't be sort of said, well, it's fine, we don't need the word. So I just want to thank you and hope you understand the power of your prayer and the power of your support. Thank you very much. So if that video looked a little familiar to you, that was a composite of different things that church leaders have said about Sarah at the Sarah Meets event. And I'd like to thank Barbara Luster, one of the new staff members, for putting that together for us. Uh, this video will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, as well as the full-length versions of all of those talks. So we'll have this available for all Sarahs. Thank you. All right, and I'll turn things back over to Tim O'Neill. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Again, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping this morning because on your name tags. My name is Tim O'Neill. My wife always says you need to tell people who you are. So that's the name tag, Tim O'Neill. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I'm past president of Sarah International and currently the president of the Sarah International Foundation. <clears throat> the reason I bring up the name tags is because the blue color in certain name tags means that you currently serve on a board of either Sarah International, the foundation, or the USA Council. For those people that have a white name tag, <clears throat> those are people that have been with us on several occasions at our international conventions. For those that have the yellow name tag, those signify that this is their first time attending an international convention, or at least a paid registration for an international <laughs> convention. So the point of that that we wanted to bring forth as we jumpstart uh, our Sarah programs again, is we want people that notice the yellow uh, name tags to reach out to those people, welcome those people. And if the people with the yellow name tags have questions, you'll know that the people with blue or a board member, you can ask questions. So if anything comes up, but again, I encourage the people with the white and the blue to reach out to the people in the yellow. So. Also in your uh, name badges, there is a schedule for today's activities. So there's a complete schedule in, in uh, the name badges. Also, most of all of our meetings will be held in this room. Our lunch today will be in the grand ballroom, which is right behind this wall. So after these sessions, if we just go down the hall and continue today, for confessions, the confessions will be held in the room that we were in last night for the reception. It will be quieter with the... <laughs> so we will we will have confessions in, in that room. Again, the Adoration Chapel is in the uh, Wilson room. And for those that haven't been there or will look for it, if you just come down this hall, there's a flight of stairs that go downstairs, one flight. And if you go to the end of the hall, you'll see a sign for the Wilson room. So this morning we're going to start off with our, our, uh, our 
keynote speaker this morning, then we'll have lunch. This afternoon, we'll have another keynote speaker, and then we'll do our concurrent sessions. And the sessions that Ann wrote was going to have as far as, was that membership and location? That will be in this room. So that's a change to the schedule. So the location program, that concurrent workshop will be held in this room. Again, confessions will be from 2.30 to 4 o'clock. At 3.30, we're going to start with a shuttle bus going over to church. I tried to find out just how, how long it would take to get to church, and a gentleman raised his hand and said, well, you know, I just had a new knee put in. And he said, it took me seven minutes. And he said, it was fine. I did fine. So I trust him. So, so for those that don't have bad knees, I guess we'll make it. But we will have a shuttle bus, and that will loop around. So we're going to start that at 3.30. So for those that want to go on the shuttle, it will be on the Monroe Street side of the, uh, the hotel here. Then this evening, what we wanted to do is when people, tonight it's a dinner on your own. One of the things that we wanted to try to do is when people come back from dinner, there's kind of this, you know, other than some of the hospitality rooms, but we wanted to have entertainment. So tonight at uh, eight o'clock, we're having the Holy Ghost bingo with the nuns for fun. And that'll be held right here in this room. So that should be rather entertaining. Uh, it's, so we certainly want you to all come back to that. This morning, it's my pleasure to introduce Father Brian Welter. Father Welter started life right here in Chicago. He was baptized at St. Margaret Mary Parish in Chicago, across the street from where his family lived. And I think all of us remember some of those days when the church was right within the neighborhood. So a lot of us lived right across the street from church. He and his younger brother went to public schools where he played soccer, ran track, and cross country in high school. He went to Bradley University and studied manufacturing technology. After graduation, he entered the construction field and worked for six years framing houses as a carpenter. And I think as Catholics, we all know a certain carpenter. <laughs> During this time, Father Welter experienced a renewal in his Catholic faith. He became more involved in his parish. He joined a young adult group and began to lecture on Sundays. He felt a call to, the, to be a priest during these years. Father Welter entered Mundelein Seminary in Mundelein, Illinois, as a seminarian in the fall of 2000 to prepare for the priesthood. He was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Chicago in 2005. His assignment as a priest, his first assignment as a priest was at St. Elizabeth Seton Parish in Orland Hills, Illinois. From 2005 to 2010, he served as vocation director for the Archdiocese of Chicago. And from 2010 to 2013, he was assigned as a faculty member at Mundelein Seminary, where he finished his term as vice rector on June 30th, 2020. But then he had good fortune. <clears throat> on July 1st, 2020, Father Welter moved to Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> where he became the executive director for the Institute for Priestly Formation, which is based in Omaha. The mission of IPF is to help seminarians, priests, and also bishops in their ongoing spiritual growth so that they may better lead others to Christ. Father Welter is a priest, again from the Archdiocese of Chicago, and has been affiliated with IPF as an adjunct faculty member since 2010. I can tell you we are very proud in Omaha to call him <clears throat> a son of Omaha now. So please join me in welcoming Father Brian Welter. It's 
quite an honor being called a son of Omaha. I mean, uh, it's a high praise, high praise. I know there's a lot of Omaha, Omahaans here and uh, many from all over the place, but I'm glad to be back in my, my native land, so to speak. Um, it's great being back here. It was just with a group of priests down in Kansas City, St. Joseph, um, at the beginning part of the week, I gave a retreat for them. Uh, there was their three-day convocation, so I drove up from the Ozark region yesterday um, and came up here and stayed in the city last night. So it's good to be with you uh, this morning. So this morning, oh, maybe I don't want to take that off. <laughs> um, that's okay. Uh, this morning, what we're going to do is have like a little bit of a retreat component here, and. Check, check. Okay. I don't want to have two mics going on here at the same time, so that's all right. Okay, so this morning, what we'll do is we'll go from right now until about 10.15 or 10.20, and then we'll take a solid 15-minute break, okay? And during that time, you know, do whatever you need to do during your break time, but then I'll, I'll give a designated time when we're coming back, um, and I'll bring in the Blessed Sacrament that's downstairs, and we'll have uh, Blessed Sacrament on the altar for the second talk, and I'll talk a little bit, we'll have the Lord exposed here, and then we'll have a little bit of time of silence and prayer, and then end with benediction. Okay, so that'll be our, our morning this morning. Uh, but I'll let you know every step of the way. It's not written out on your schedules there. I'll give you time frames. But before I get into the talk, and we've got some notes in a few minutes that uh, Tim and, and John will hand out, I just wanted to uh, expand a little bit on my own life and the, the, the support I found as I was discerning my own vocation. Um, <clears throat> I was a carpenter. It was a great, it was a great gift to me to learn that trade and to work uh, for years framing houses, mostly in the, the western western suburbs. Uh, it was a great, great life experience. Met a lot of great people. But it was during that time I felt uh, a draw back into the church. I was born Catholic, lapsed, you know, went went away to college and just stopped practicing my faith for a while. Uh, one of the instrumental people in my life was my grandmother who lived with us for a period of time. This is my, my dad's mother. And she, she was an immigrant from Vienna, Austria, and had a very, um, very just simple faith that she carried with her from, from the old country. And it was a great witness to me to have her live with, with us and to see her pray her prayers every day, say the rosary, and she just had this faith in, in God and in Jesus that was just always with her. Well, she died in our home, and I was in my uh, young 20s at the time, and I, was, I just graduated college. And that was a big impact on me to, to see someone that I really loved die you know, within the family. And then all the questions started coming. What is life really about? Do you just see deeper questions of, you know, my life is not just about me, it's about something else. And, and her death kind of spurred me to start thinking about these greater questions. And I found myself probably, you know, to the great joy of my mom and dad going back to Mass. Uh, they, they didn't prompt me or, or prod me, but something in the back of my mind said, why don't you just go back to church? You have these deeper questions. And I was grateful that the the law of the land in our house growing up, if you lived in the house, you went to Mass on Sunday. That was the deal. I mean, if you didn't want to go to Mass on Sunday, you didn't have to live in the house. So, <laughs> there it was. So, I knew very, from very early on that Mass was important. Uh, my mom sang in the choir. But it was really, it was the, I'll talk about my dad later this morning, but he's a quieter man. But to watch him pray after receiving communion, in real deep prayer and kneeling, it, it was a profound impact on me for, for my whole life. And something inside of me said during these, uh, these days and weeks and months after my grandmother died, go back to Mass. And slowly I started going back and just said, you know, I'm going to make this a regular practice every, um, every Sunday going back to Mass. And I got involved with, a, uh, with, with being a lector there. The parish priest asked if I would, uh, if I would lector. 
And I did. And I was, I was dating a, a woman at the time. And so that was going on and I was working and I, I kind of thought that I was going in a certain direction that I wanted to start my own business and eventually start a family. But I remember one day in particular, it was a Sunday morning mass. And there was a young uh, man that was speaking after mass. He was a sem seminarian. Now, I really had never heard that word before in my life. I kind of knew that uh, guys entered something called the seminary. I never saw the seminary growing up. Um, vaguely heard about it. Funny side note, though, both my dad and my grandfather both went to the high school seminary. And of course, they both left. Um, and that's why I'm here today. But, <laughs> but so, okay, the Lord got his pound of flesh. I, I entered the seminary at some point. Um, but this, this young woman was speaking after Mass about the seminary, online seminary. And typically, the seminarians go out in the fall and, and thank the parishioners for their support of the seminary. And uh, you know the annual contribution, the collection that's taken up for the seminary. But right at the end, he said, "You know, um, there's not a lot of young men becoming priests anymore. So if there's any young men out there that are thinking about the priesthood, you might want to consider it." And I remember I'm standing in the back of the church, and I listen to that, and I walk out. I'm walking back to my apartment, walking right across a little baseball field uh, in the neighborhood. And inside of me, there was just a very gentle question. And the question was this, Brian, why didn't you become a priest? Out of nowhere, this question came. I had never thought about the priesthood in my life. I was a public school guy, had very little contact with priests in my, uh, in my upbringing. And there it was, and it never left me. Um, I, like Jonah, tried to run the opposite direction <laughs> very far and very fast. But every morning when I woke up, there it was. There was this question. I wanted to distract myself, read something, do something. But what I found was um, if I could get to morning mass in our parish, I began to go there. And usually I'd have to be on the road even earlier than mass time. But at some point, even after the work was over, I'd stop by uh, the church and was open and make a, make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament. And then things, things started happening. Um, a couple of key people started noticing this odd behavior. I was going to Mass more than Sunday. My girlfriend, number one, was the first one. She said, why do you go to Mass all the time? Are you thinking about becoming a priest? I said, well, the thought has occurred to me. Now, you want to talk about a relationship killer right now. <laughs> that was it. It was over. And then my mom, I think my mom had a, an intuition, and she uh, at some point noticed something. But then people in the church would notice things and say things. Um, just people I didn't even know. They would ask me, are you thinking about becoming a priest? And so long story short, I, I uh, became involved in a group here in the Archdiocese. We would meet on Tuesday nights at the cathedral every Tuesday night from September until May. And it was a group of post-college age men who were considering a priesthood. And there's priests that ran this, this discernment group. And I, I honestly, I can't, it must be the grace of God because I... I like at the end of the day when I'm done working just to kind of relax a little bit. I'm exhausted from being outside all day. But I would drive from the south and the west suburbs downtown every Tuesday, fighting traffic to get to, to this discernment group. And to, you know, that question was, was still weighing on me. Um, should I be a priest? Should I not? Should I enter the seminary? Should I not? But then it became uh, very clear that the Lord was leading me in this direction. And I entered the seminary in the fall of 2000. Um, not with all things worked out in my mind, I still had a lot of questions. I, I didn't know any seminarians. It was all brand new to me. There's a whole language around seminary culture and life that I had no idea about. But I learned along the way. And I, I was at Mundelein Seminary for five years and uh, was ordained in, in May 2005. 
Um, so that's kind of a little snippet of my story, but there's a lot of support along the way, family, um, people in the parish, and my big fear was, it was very interesting, guys I went to college with, um, it was a split kind of decision for them. Some of them were very uh, encouraged and supportive when I, when I started telling people that I was going to enter the seminary. Others had really big questions. That they probably never saw this side of me before. Um, but it was, it was the guys at work that I was afraid of telling them. And to a man, they all said, Brian, that is excellent. It was just this great moment to have this affirmation from these, these guys, these tradesmen that, that I worked with for, for many years. And they just, it was just the support. Not all of them were Catholic, but they all saw it as, as a great path to follow. So it was very honored, and I just remember them very, uh, very deeply in my heart that they supported the, this decision. So, okay, so uh, the breaks right there, and we have some handouts that are coming around here. And just to note, there's a lot of words on these handouts, uh, so we're not going to, you know. We're not going to do like a big uh, homework assignment here or anything. These are just little little thoughts. I'm going to jump off on them. It's really to help draw us all into um, just a deeper relationship with the Lord this morning and going forward. So I'll pause here for a minute or two as these are being spirited. Handouts are they fairly distributed? Does anyone not have a, a sheet of paper here? We got a couple of people in the back that need some handouts that are standing in the back. Tim, have some handouts here. Okay, great. All right, so let, I just want to start with a with a scripture passage here that we're all familiar with, and this is from John chapter twenty. This is on the morning of the resurrection. First verse, John chapter 20. On the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial clouds there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial clouds there, and the cloth that had covered his head not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. 
Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, and he saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. But Mary stayed outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she bent over into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus there, but did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener, and said to him, Sir, if you carry him away, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. So I just want to start right there with that passage. Mary is looking for something. And I want to give an explanation on the title here and the, the title of the talk. Um, the title I'm calling this, the whole talk this morning, Finding God of All Things, Christ's Unpaid unpaid for a desire to love you. So, just as a, to know that we can't pay for God's love. We can't earn it. It's simply and freely given it to all of us. And to be able to receive that and enter into that. But the talk that I, uh, this first morning, this, this morning section, calling the long exposure in the night, and I'll get to that in a minute, so I'm going to try to bring together some, some things about stars and science and photography that might help shed a little bit of light on our own faith. Mary, Mary Magdalene is going to the tomb early in the morning while it is still dark. There's the faintest of light right there. And she can see the empty tomb and then as light breaks a little more, the angels, but she still doesn't recognize the Lord that's behind her. There's not a long enough exposure there until Jesus calls her by name. So, our jumping off point this morning, just to consider for all of us, Mary Magdalene was expecting to see Jesus dead in the tomb. That was her expectation, but what she ended up seeing was life, the author of life, Jesus. So, a couple jumping off points here. Photog photographing a black hole. Do you remember, um, maybe you remember this, it was probably three or four years ago, it, it went through the news that it was the first ever image captured of a black hole being photographed. And what you saw was, in, on the websites or in the newspapers, you saw the ring of light around just a circle of darkness. It's all the light falling into the deep gravitational field of the black hole. But how did they do this? They didn't just take out their the Canon, you know, EOS camera and point it up there, right? So what happened is uh, astronomers across the globe basically linked together all, all these different telescopes and they made a camera, basically, the size of the Earth, so to speak. So they linked all these telescopes together, but they pointed it in this direction where it is, they thought the black hole was, and they allowed the exposure, the aperture, if you're a photographer, you know, keeping the aperture open lets light into the camera. And for those who remember developing film, uh, the, the beauty of, of that, but also the horror of it, is that when you develop a film, you root like half the pictures. You didn't know it until you went to photo it to have your film developed. Because maybe you had too short exposure, too long exposure. But anyway, the scientists, they linked together all these telescopes across the globe, and they exposed the, uh, the open the aperture for five days, for five days. And what they got was this, they, they compiled together these images and they saw the light that was falling into the gravitational field of the black hole. But what they needed to do this was stability. 
And they needed these telescopes to be open for five days. They needed a baseline. So I'm using that image for all of us that Mary Magdalene, she could have easily looked in the tomb in the faintest, under the faintest of lights, the faintest of conditions, and said, you know, Jesus is not there. And she could have ran back home with the other disciples. But as she was there in the faint light, looking, and then seeing more as she stays there, the angels, then the gardener, and then the voice comes, and then she realizes it's Jesus. The same thing for all of us. At times, we can, we can glance over and gloss over these little, these little faint moments of light in our life. And yet, there's the presence of the Lord quite possibly for us. So to stay there and observe. Star trails. Okay, I remember taking a high school photography class, and this is before digital cameras were invented. So we had an assignment. Uh, we had a dark room in the high school. We developed our all our own film. But on a certain night, we had to go outside, set up a tripod with our camera, and it had to be, you know, middle of the night, and aim the camera up at the sky. And you were in this little cable that kept the aperture open. And you kept it open for three or four or five minutes. So you, you allowed the starlight to shine on the film. And what you notice if you developed the film, and you probably see pictures of this, you don't just get a nice starry sky. You see the streaks of light. You see that the Earth is in rotation. And as you're, you're rotating and the camera is open, it's exposing that film for five minutes. So when we stay in front of light that we think is static and there's nothing dynamic there, we can easily miss something. We can easily walk outside at night under the stars, especially for those who live out in the country. It's so beautiful, the starlight there. You just look up and say, wow, it's a beautiful starry night. It's wonderful. But then you, then you photograph it for an extended period of time and say, wait a second. The stars aren't just sitting there, static, not moving. We're, we're all in motion here. We expose ourselves to the light just a little bit longer than normal. We begin to notice things that we simply didn't notice before. So that's the horizon of our talk right here. What is God giving us in, in all of this as we're exposing ourselves to the faintest of God's light? Light. He's giving us himself. And that's what uh, that Mary discovered you know, as she was there at, at the tomb. So what are these points of light for all of us? Um, I'll jump into this since we're going to be in front of the Blessed Sacrament here in a little bit. One is the Lord himself in, in the Blessed Sacrament, in the monasteries. You know that great story of St. John the Abbey, uh, the parish priest when he was in Ars, France. He walked by a chapel one day and he saw a farmer sitting in front of the tabernacle every day. And he asked the farmer, he said, what do you do there as you sit in front of the tabernacle? And the farmer said, I look at him and he looks at me. That is profound faith. I mean, a farmer just sitting there in front of the blessed sacrament looking at Jesus and allowing Jesus to look at him. So, for you and I, when we're in front of the Blessed Sacrament, there is a long exposure, so to speak. Sometimes our faith is a little dark. Like, what is the Lord doing in my life right now? But to stay there and allow things to be disclosed to us that we had never noticed before. What are other points of light? People, events, ideas that come into view. So we all live these lives of relationship. There are new people that come into your life. There are new events that come into your life. There are new ideas that come into your life. And to pause for a second and to say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do with all of this as these new things are coming into my life? How do you want me to enter into that? Do you want me to do something about it? Do you not? There's a, there's a horizon that we're asked to enter into, this expanding horizon. And it brings you questions. 
When Mary Magdalene is there at the tomb, she sees the angels, and then she turns around and sees the gardener. She has stayed long enough that new questions are arising. Where did you take my Lord? The question arises in her. She sees the gardener there. I will go and take care of him. When we stay in front of the Lord, when we ask the question, how do you want me, Jesus, to go into these new events, new relationships that are coming into view, we have new questions that arise within us. Notice uh, Moses on the hiddenness. Remember from the, the scripture passage in Exodus, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Remember we read it every year, but I'll tell you the, uh, the cliff note version. So Moses would speak to the Lord face to face, and he would come out of the tent of meeting, and his face would be radiant. And if people couldn't stand it, they'd say, Moses, put a veil over your face. You're shining too much. Well, then we were all shining. But because he was facing God, his face shone like the sun. You know, you know people like this. Um, my grandmother was a person like this, that there was just a glow to the person. And you can't explain it. It's not like they had new makeup on that morning. There's just this glow that comes from the inside and shines outward. And I think people of simple faith have that over many years of talking with the Lord. There is this interior light that other people can see on our faces. They're drawn to that. They're attracted to that. There's a great poem uh, from St. John of the Cross. And St. John of the Cross, was in, he was in prison for nine months of his life. And he, um, in a real dark, uh, he was being in prison, it was very dark, there were horrific conditions, but he couldn't find God inside of it too. He, he wondered, this poem came out of him during his prison years. The first line of the poem, he's speaking to God. And that's what, that's what uh, gives a clue to, to, to John, St. John of the Cross's faith. It's the first line of the poem. He addresses it to God. Where have you hidden? When you and I, if we ever address God like that, Lord, where are you in my life? You're on holy ground. You're in a good spot. If you are actually telling God about what's going on inside you, where are you right now in the situation in my life? You're actually talking to him. That belies a very deep faith that you carry already within you. And I would hold that up in great reverence. So St. John of the Cross uh, writes this poem when he's in prison. It's a long poem, but it's a beautiful poem. The first line, where are you hidden? And then he goes on with the poem. On the, uh, the back page of your, your handout, it says on page six, appendix A, appendix A, There's a colleague of mine, very, very uh, faithful woman in the church, works for the church, um, is just a very, just a solid person. Um, Mary Wilton family does a lot of great things for the Catholic Church. But she had a very tough conversion in her life. And this is her story. She, she told this to a group of, uh, group of seminarians and priests one day. And she said it elsewhere. This is from the talk. This is a fact. I was able to make the two and a half year journey of intellectual, moral, and spiritual conversion because I was accompanied by a priest, a priest to whom I was not just a piece of paper, a blunt list of particular transgressions. This is a great priest. And no, it is not me who is that priest. The priest initially offered me a simple and holy thing, nothing fancy, nothing intellectually riveting or filled with spiritual gravitas. He simply offered me hospitality. He was willing to entertain the possibility that I was likable and was willing to spend time in my company, even though I didn't remotely think the same way he did. It was a real relationship soaked in a deep Christian ethos that is often lost. Meaning this priest didn't demand that I change as a condition for the hospitality he offered me. He did not make me feel an object of conversion, 
I felt like a full person in front of him. If he had insisted that I have a certain type of conversion of heart and mind as a condition of our spending time together, I'd have been out the door. But he hung in there with me over the time it took, took for me to make my way back to Catholicism. His question at the time may have been, how in the name of you, Lord, do I get this girl back to you? But that was not my question. I was not asking, how do I get back to you, Lord? And I certainly was a million miles away from making me right with the church. I didn't even have a question. I just had an internal utterance, quiet and demanding. And it was this, help. So, this is a great, great example. I don't know who this priest is. It's a great example to me. For him to stay there and see the faint light of Christ working in the heart of this woman. And he could have written her off. He could have been very quick to judge her and say, the lifestyle you're living is absolutely the, the wrong way to go. But he noticed what God was doing in her, and he stayed with it. This long exposure to the faintest of light, long exposure in the night, the night of someone's life, and to see and believe in faith that Jesus is there. On deserts, black holes, or any other deprived sensory input. So, of course, those two passages from Exodus as they're leaving. Uh, they're leaving slavery in Egypt. Remember, the Israelites are finally being led out of Egypt by Moses. And the Lord preceded them in the daytime by means of a column of cloud to show them the way, and at night by means of a column of fire to give them light. Thus they could travel both day and night. Neither the column of cloud by day nor the column of fire by night ever left this place in front of the people. Just notice that. Day and night, they're given some type of direction here by God. And then when they're in the desert, remember, Pharaoh was upset that he let the Israelites go. The Israelites are wandering about aimlessly in the land. The wilderness is closed in on them. Who of us at times, or maybe someone we've known in our life, has had this sensation of being in the wilderness part of their life? feels like they're being hemmed in and closed in. And we don't have an experience of God at times when we're in this desert period, where people we know have said they're in this desert period. So we just pause there. This is a great quote from Ian Matthew. He wrote a great book called The Impact of God. Give me an experience of God. We all want that at some level. Where we make room, God fills it. And where we cannot, God undertakes to create room so that he may fill it. So just to notice this, we may have a robust faith and say, okay, Lord, expand my heart. I want to know more of you. But for many of us, the desert is not something we choose. We're, we're led into it or it descends upon us in some way. So some people are led into the desert, the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. Jesus is brought out into the desert for 40 days. He resists temptation in the desert. The Spirit rolled him out there. Some visit the desert on their own accord when we go through Lent, right? I'm giving up this out of love for the Lord. So we, we impose a, a small desert upon ourselves and so that we grow in faith, hope, and love. But then some have the desert descend upon them. The Israelites are spun around in the desert. The COVID pandemic, we didn't want it, we didn't expect it. We had to change our lives during that time. Some people were very isolated. The desert descended upon us. There are new situations that upend our lives, job transfers, sudden illnesses, public figures who are publicly humiliated. So there is this desert that descends, on, descends upon people. So page, we're on page two here. Okay. 
So these things can upend us, they spin us around, they're moments of bewilderment. But effectively, maybe we have said the same thing in our life that people close to us have as the desert has said to oh, him, God, where have you hidden in all of this? If people are crying out to God in the desert, God is very near, and that person is very near to God. I mean, you can't cry out to someone because you don't want to have him in your life. If we're crying out, he's right there. We're very close. We're on holy ground. Now, prayer may seem difficult at times. We don't have the words. It doesn't feel the same when we pray. God may seem absent, but he's seeking us all the more as we're crying out to him. So notice the effect on the Israelites. They're 430 years in Egypt, and God brings them in this desert, right? They're 430 years under slavery in Egypt. They're set free, and then they wander about 40 years in the desert. And one could say, well, that was kind of a tough thing that God did did to them. Why didn't God just reestablish them right away in the Israelite community? Why did they have to go through this period in the desert. Well, the one thing I know, I know, I know very few things, one or two things. <laughs> I'm out in Omaha now, and invariably, I don't know it, but people will say to me in the parish, Father, I know you're not from around here. Your, your accent is from some other place. <laughs> My speech gives me away. The Israelites began to speak like Egyptians, right? They ate the food of the Egyptian culture, not their own Israelite food. So they spoke like Egyptians. They ate food like Egyptians. Wait for it. (laughs) Wait for it. They walked like Egyptians. So the desert actually is an act of God's love on them. It's a reorienting of the Israelites to their true culture. Learning again to, remember they ate manna in the desert. You know, they ate it for 40 years. And then there was that, that period where they only had quail, so much that it was coming out of their nostrils, as it says in the scriptures. So manna and quail is no way to live. But God was stripping down the taste of Egyptian culture for their true home, their true culture. And for for the Israelites to miss that is to miss God's love for them. So sometimes the desert descends upon us in different ways, and we cry out, where have you hidden? Okay, maybe God is actually loving me in a deep way here that has not yet revealed itself uh, in my life. And the effect of staying with God in that, it increases our faith, hope, and love. So in the light of faith, hope, and love, if given another chance to assert myself over others, I instead resist the urge to dominate, allow the others to be themselves, and say to God, I don't need that, I need you. That is love. The desert can have that effect on us, where we grow in love because of the desert. If someone on whose example my belief had depended ups and abandons the gospel they had taught me to embrace, and I nonetheless still cling to the gospel, that is faith. If in the face of deep-seated defect I do not allow cynicism, it'll never change. To close doors on the future, that is hope. Faith, hope, and love can become magnified when we're in the desert. Where are you, Lord? And we don't turn away from the Faintness of light, we just stay exposed to God in that. When Peter, when people don't live up to what I expected, Judas betrays Jesus, the disciples fled, when my religion makes me feel isolated, when I am not free to live up to my commitments, St. Peter, the charcoal fire, he denies Jesus, but feel compelled to keep things from getting out of hand, Pontius Pilate. He wipes his hands at the whole thing. He doesn't want to get involved. Imagine if they would have said no to these attitudes that were self-focused. If Peter said, you know what, no, I'm not going to stand by the charcoal fire and deny Jesus. I'm going to actually be with him. 
What if Pilate didn't wash his hands? So we say no to the attitude inside of us to keep us self-focused, and we say yes to Jesus, the horizon that Christ invites us into. Some more dark and light uh, illuminations here. Stay with, um, let me stay with, I'll, I'll skip around here for a minute. At the bottom of page two, uh, on staying close to the fire, I'll get back to the other ones in a minute. Remember Jesus in, in Mark's gospel, it often talks about him praying, rising very early before dawn, he left and went to a deserted place where he prayed. I remember uh, taking our youth group when I was in the parish. Uh, every year we would take the, the uh, like eighth grade through, through senior year on a mission trip. And we'd take them to usually these places that are run by the Catholic Hard Work Camp. And it's a great organization. We went twice down to uh, Cairo, Illinois, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and then Oddly, of all places, Omaha, Nebraska. I, I didn't know I would. I didn't know I would end up there. But uh, we we took uh, several van loads of kids out to Omaha, Nebraska, and usually we, we stay in, in Catholic high schools on the gym floor or something. We stay in a now closed Catholic high school, Crystal Ray High School, um, in South Omaha, right near St. Peter's, uh, St. Peter's Church. And there were hundreds of kids from across the country there. And then we would go out to different areas in, in the poor sections of these towns. And the, the, uh, the task that my team was given, we had to build um, a, a wooden wheelchair ramp on the front of this house uh, for this, this elderly person that uh, couldn't get out of this front door. So it was great. Being a carpenter, he was able to use those skills and, and really show the kids um, something that they, they could be really proud of. Well, as you imagine, kids stay up late, and it's it's you know the evenings are usually some type of band or some type of entertainment, and it's it's a long day, it's hot out in the summer, and you don't get good sleep. But I would be up early, very early in the morning. But I was not the first one up. I was trying to look for coffee. There's always this one gentleman, uh, an elderly gentleman, and he'd be sitting on the stairs in this right outside the gym, like these. You know, high school stairs, he'd be sitting out there. He'd have his boots on, they were unlaced. And I just kind of noticed, I thought, okay, he's kind of groggy like I am. He's just kind of slowly putting his shoes on for the day to, to go out to the work site somewhere. And several days later, I noticed actually he's praying the rosary. He's up early in the morning, he's praying the rosary. And finally, I, I uh, at lunch one day, I stood next to him and I kind of just sidled up next to him. I wanted to hear his story. So I introduced myself. And he told me, he said, you know, um, I'm from a small town in Wisconsin. And I'm a farmer. And then I also work as um, uh, he was a machinist in the town that he was in to, to make ends meet. And, and he was, you know, in his 70s at the time. And he said, um, we don't have a resident parish priest in our church. There's a priest that visits several parishes uh, to come say mass on Sundays. We don't have a youth minister. And my granddaughter is in high school. And she came to read. She heard about this Catholic Heart Work Camp. And she said, uh, Grandpa, we don't have anyone to chaperone us on this mission trip. Would you take a group of us in high school here? And he, he did. And if you've been on mission trips with kids before, they're exhausting. But I just was just kind of blown away by this man's yes. That here he is, he's got two jobs. I mean, he's in the twilight of his years because he's doing many other things. And he's got to drive from central Wisconsin to Omaha in wherever they took a small van with eight high school kids. And he's the first one up in the morning to pray the rosary. It just has always stayed with me that I mean, this is going back 13 years, and it, I'm still very moved uh, by the witness of him and his simple faith. 
And then this fellow, Bruce, uh, who is our youth minister at the parish, so I would always look at Bruce and another gentleman. Their kids were in the youth group, so it's great to have them. But on one occasion, um, I, was, I was rooming with Bruce, he was the youth minister, and he and I, uh, I noticed it, the lights went off, and, and I could kind of faint see him kneeling in the darkness. And he's a working man. He works, I think he works for the government somewhere in the city here. And uh, the next morning, I woke up, what was going on? He was I was just, I was saying my prayers before I went to bed. He was a Catholic man, married, family, he's got a job, you know, extending himself. And in the dark, there he is kneeling before the Lord, just saying his prayers. These, these uh, witnesses, uh, touch me because people are staying close to the fire, which is Jesus, in their own prayer life. And even though they're exhausted, they continue to pray. Candlelight photography. So another uh, photography thing that has touched me recently. When I was growing up, my dad had on his desk, he had a little office in the house and uh, Maybe not even off, it was a little desk. It was a little photograph. And the photograph was my dad was a Marine in Vietnam for part of his career. And he took a photograph when he was over there. And it was a photograph by candlelight. He was in his bunker. He had a candle that was lit. And what we see in the photograph, you can see the light of the candle. A small, like little two by two image or three by three image of my mom, his wife, his map, his compass, and his gun. And that's all that was in the photograph. He always had it sitting on his desk. And then, you know, I went to high school and college, and the photograph disappeared for, for many years. I haven't seen it actually since. But I was uh, on a retreat last year, actually. And I was, I was the only one in the retreat house because, you know, the pandemic shut down a lot of the people coming and traveling. I was at the retreat house up in Mundelein. And I'm saying mass on my own. So I'm the only one there. I'm taking my time. And as right after the consecration of the Eucharist, I hold up the Eucharist, and this image of my dad's candlelight photo flashes in front of me. And later on in the retreat, I stayed with that, and I just realized, and I asked my dad about that photo, he said, yeah, that photograph, I wanted to get the photograph because the candlelight only threw off so much light. I wanted the things that mattered to me most in the light of the candlelight, and I took a photograph of that. So at the time, it was my mom, his compass, his map, and his gun. That's what mattered to him most at that stage of his life. I think the compass and have gun probably are you know, of secondary importance at this point, but my mom still occupies the center of his life. But I thought about that. If we were to sit in front of the Lord, the Blessed Sacrament, or the Mass, you know, a lot of times we can be filled with anxiety. There are all these things that are going on in my life, all these thoughts, and all the things I think I need to take care of. When Jesus shines his light upon us, we can ask him, Lord, what matters most is I'm sitting here in your light. What really matters most to me? Reorder, like the Israelites, what is most important, the gifts that you have given me. And sometimes as we're praying, the distractions and things can sift out. Oh yeah, what is most important? Is my wife, is my husband, or for me as a priest, my prayer life, the people I serve, etc. So it can reorient and focus us uh, as we stay in the light of the Lord. Another way to look at it, it's kind of kitschy, I know, I know. Protection, direction, affection. That was kind of what I saw in my dad's little photograph. The gun, protection, the map, direction, my mom, affection. So, whatever way you want to do it, but allowing Jesus to reorient 
by stating in his life what is most important, both to you and me, Jesus, in our, in our life together. It's easy to light a fire. The morning offering, um, I wanted to make a, some comment about the, the daily morning offering. I don't know why I wrote this on my notes here, but anyway, if you pray the morning offering, I pray it, it's a great prayer. Um, in, in your own words, how do we want to offer ourselves to the Lord every morning? But it's easy to light a fire. That was the other one. So I remember working, um, working construction, working as a carpenter, and we worked outside, so we framed houses. Once in a while, we had some, some inside trim work to do. But when February rolled around, it, it just was very, as you know, in the Midwest, working outside in February is it's rough. I mean, it's um, the summer, the spring, beautiful. You're, you've got the shorts, you've got the wind, you've got the sun. All your buddies are working in an office, you're outside. But then February comes around, and you're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing out here? So uh, at noon, we come down from the, whatever floor we're on in the house. And I worked for my uncle. He ran the crew. And he would start a fire in the, in, right in the front of the job site. And we would sit around this little fire, middle of February, Tuesday afternoon, and noon, having lunch, you know, the eight or nine of us that were on the crew. And it was a beautiful thing, it was a beautiful memory. It was cold out, but there was some warmth there that the fire was, was uh, given off. At some point in my career, I moved to another crew. And when I, when I finally left the trades, I looked back on that and I realized the second crew that I was on, we all went to our cars and trucks for lunch and winter. We didn't sit around with one another. No one built a fire. And I remember uh, before I went to the seminary, I thanked my uncle for all those, just the memory of working with him. I said, oh, thanks for letting that, that fire every, every uh, day of lunch. And he said, it's easy to light a fire. He said, you know, job site's got a lot of wood, and uh, there's construction glue, which is highly flammable, and it goes up in the summer. <laughs> so I thought about that, though. It's very easy to light a fire in terms of our faith, small little ways we can light a fire in, in the hearts and minds of other people. A lot of times you think, it's gotta, I've got to know a lot of theology, I've got to know all these things. No, the witness that you have to faith is lighting fires uh, for other people. So just to consider that, and to consider um, the encouragement that you give to people might be a way to light a fire too. Now, I'll go back to that story. I'll, I'll probably close with this story where it says that on page two on darkness and illumination. And I only fell into this story by happenstance, and I didn't realize the impact of it. So, so I have a friend named John, and he and I grew up together. We're uh, known we've known each other our whole life, basically. Although, actually, he did start a life out in Chicago. He started out in California, and it was, he moved here when he was seven. And I remember, these are the days when, in grade school, we had to wait outside uh, before the doors opened. So if you got there early, you might be waiting out in the cold for 5, 10, 15 minutes. And I don't know, I'm sounding like, oh, the, kid, the generation now doesn't do that, but um, but anyway, what I remember was it was a cold day, and here was this new kid that was in this like thin, wispy California windbreaker and no gloves. I'm like, oh my god! You know, as a seven year old, you're like, who is this guy? <laughs> and um, he learned quickly that he needed a bigger jacket. But so John and I have known each other for forever, and he married this girl that we grew up with. And at some point, I stood up at the wedding right after college. And when I entered the seminary, he was going through a divorce. And she she wanted to move on with her life and do something else. And it, it really was, was very difficult for him. He was he's just a very good man, and it just kind of spun him around. And this was before cell phones were around and, and texting. And so I remember one night I was in the seminary not that long. 
I said, you know what? I'm going to, I wrote my friend John a little note. I said, John, I'm sorry about what you're going through. Um, I'm praying for you. He was Catholic. His dad actually was one of the first people that ever came up to me and said, hey, Brian, are you thinking about being a priest before anyone else? His dad saw something. So I said, John, I'm sorry about what you're going through. I'm praying for you. I said, John, you know, besides my mom, my dad, and my brother, your voice is the most familiar to me. I can hear it inside of me. I've known you my whole life. So I write this note off. And so I send it. And then I think, oh, he's going to think I'm crazy, right? I hear your voice, man. And... <laughs> so anyway, a couple days or a week or two go by, and he, he calls me. And he said, Brian, I was so grateful to get your notes. It was very tough, but it was very encouraging uh, to get that note. And so that was, I don't know, that was 20 years ago that that happened. Well, um, last year, it was two years ago, is, is I'm on retreat. And you know how it is sometimes when you pray, and you pray to the Lord, and you wonder, like, he said, is that God's voice that I'm hearing? But it kind of sounds like my voice. Is it my voice? Am I making this up? Or is it your voice? And then you begin to have this dialogue with Jesus, like, is that your voice or is that my voice? Well, if we're at that stage of the game, it, it's both voices. If we're addressing it to the Lord. But I'm there, and this I'm sitting there in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and I just have this question with Jesus, like, I feel real close to you. Wait a second, am I saying that to you or are you saying that to me? What's and I was caught up in the spiral, like, who's speaking here? And then this memory of me writing this note to my friend John comes up to my mind. And you're the most familiar voice outside my mom, dad, and brother. And I just realized that if we spend a lot of time in prayer with the Lord, there is a familiarity with the way he deals with us. He may not be direct. He may not be dictating notes to us, but you know the familiarity uh, because you've spent so much time with him in your life praying to him. And it just became this moment where I realized that, um, no, it was the Lord's voice there, and he is with you too. And the one thing to notice is this, voices of affirmation carry a presence. John, being a good friend of mine, I could hear his voice. He was always encouraging to me. His voice in my head, hearing his presence. When I told John, I can hear you, your voice in me, so my presence is being extended to him. The same thing in our relationship when we pray between us and God. But God's voice maintains your personal identity. It doesn't tear you down. And it reminds you that you are known. And here's the thing about lightning fires. Sometimes people don't know that they're known by God. And little void, little moments of affirmation to people to let them know that they are known by God can be very pivotal in their life. You know, you are known. My aunt, she's my great aunt, a little, little Irish woman, and very, very simple uh, woman, but she always told her children and her grandchildren when they came in the kitchen to come see her, I love you. They, need, they may or may not practice their faith now, whatever, but they always knew and they still know that they are loved. And voices of affirmation carry a presence. Carry a presence as well. So we light little fires when we remind people that they're known by God. Sometimes there are voices that come up inside of us that tear down our personal identity. This is not of God. And it's hard not to pay attention to him, but more and more I'm like, no, I'm not going to listen to this voice that's creeping inside of me. God's voice in me maintains my identity. It reminds me that I am known. The Eucharist reminds you and me that we are known. You are known by Jesus in the Eucharist. 
Okay, I'm going to hit the brace right here. It's almost 1020. At 1035, I will I'll be walking through the back door here with the monasteries and the Blessed Sacrament. And we'll place it on the altar. Just, um, you don't have to, if you can't kneel, that's okay. We'll just have a moment of silence. I'll say a little prayer. I'll continue on, continue on with the talk in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and then we'll have a few moments of silence to pray um, toward the end of the morning, and then I'll do a uh, benediction, okay? And then we don't have incense and everything, but we'll, we'll make do because we're in a hotel here, okay? Great. So 10.35, thanks. John's Gospel. So Jesus said to them, Amen, when I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Okay, while we're here in front of the Lord, just allow him to continue to speak to our own minds and hearts. We'll, we'll go through these uh, points of meditation, and we'll be drawn into some kind of prayer, wherever it leads us. Um, we'll take a few minutes at the end of my talk in silence, just a few minutes. I know it's, maybe we do it longer, we'll go back home, but together here, so a few minutes of silence, I'll lead us into a meditation, and then I'll lead us into a meditation to close out the morning. Okay, so... On page three, on staying close to Jesus, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. One of the things that um, is learning, and it's learning for me, and learning for a lot of people, is that we encounter Jesus in the night, in, the, in those faint moments of light. Mary Magdalene encountered Jesus there in the early morning hours. She encountered Jesus in the anguish of her heart. Where have you taken my Lord? She says to the, to the gardener. She encounters Jesus in the midst of the struggle. 
not when the struggle is over. So a lot of times, if we're going through a, a trial or something that's going on in our life, and if it can be in a person's life, I'll find the Lord when all this is over. But the encounter, the deep encounter happens in the midst of the struggle and the trial. And that's where the intimacy uh, with Jesus comes forth. It's, the intimacy is born in the struggle. As if to say in the midst of the struggle, some woman said that she's going through a big trial in her life. She said, Jesus and I have become very close. She and I have become very close. Final point uh, was right about that on the concealed questions. Just to remember when Adam and Eve are in the garden, there's a question there, and it, it depends on how we hear this question, but the more I sit with it, the more I like to think it's a very healing question. After Adam and Eve, they disobey God, they eat um, of the fruit of the tree, God says to Adam, where are we? And Adam says, I'm in the garden, hiding. Now, for many years, when I heard that scripture passage, I heard it as more of a demanding tone on God's part. Like, where are you? Like, God wanted to get Adam. But the more I read the scriptures, the more I say, immersed in our faith, the question is a healing question. Where are you? I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? I'm naked and afraid. Now, Adam leaves it there. He could have told God why he was naked and afraid. I'm naked and afraid because I disobeyed you, and I think you're going to get me. But he doesn't go there. So the question for us is, when we hear this, God saying, where are you? It begins a dialogue. When there's fear at times that arise in our hearts, continue the dialogue with God. I'm afraid because this is going on in my life. And to hear God say, well, tell me more about that. Tell me more. We hide things at times we don't know we're hiding. Adam and Eve were hiding from God. Maybe it's images of God that need reorienting. The Israelites in the desert needed to learn who God was in the, in the desert. And when a young man is, is moving through seminary formation or before he's even in the seminary, his image of God is, is maturing. Who is this God that's calling me to be his priest? And so I bring that to the Lord in prayer. This is how I see you reveal more of yourself to me. Sometimes we can doubt the gifts that we've been given, the doubting the God of the gifts that I bring to my family, to my work, to the world. God, as Paul Benedict said, he said, each one of us has been given a particular task in life. None of us is happenstance. We're all necessary. We all have some work to offer the Lord. But, you know, that can creep into us, I doubt, at times. The other thing, sometimes for people, God seems out of reach, but they can never quite grasp him, which is true. I mean, he can't be grasped. But he does reveal himself and makes himself known. When I get wounded or criticized, I become defensive. I know that's a flaw in my personality. I want to argue back, fight back. But then I look at Jesus. When he was in his hometown and the people didn't believe him, and they said, who is this son of the carpenter? And they rejected him, the scripture says. Where does Jesus go when he's rejected? He doesn't get defensive. Where Jesus goes, he goes back to that, that first image where he's baptized in the river Jordan. Well, everyone there, you are my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. So for us, when we're rejected, where do we defensively go? And then we look at Jesus. Where did Jesus go? He went to his Father. He knows who he is. Okay, so transitioning to the bottom of page three, the long exposure to the light. We've been talking about light all along, but this is um, being in the light of day here. 
from the letter of James. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. All good giving, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. He calls him the Father of lights, so God enlightens things. I used to be a rock climber. Um, no, I'm kind of short and stocky. I was not a good rock climber. And if I fell, I fell like a rock. <laughs> we used to climb up in this um, place in Wisconsin called Devil's Lake. It's a rock formation up there. And then I did some out in Colorado with a friend of mine. But I would, I would uh, follow, this was years old when I was younger. But recently, in 2015, there were these, these two guys out in Yosemite National Park. Tommy Caldwell and Kevin Jorgensen. I don't know that, but I follow the story you know, every day because it's so intriguing. When the sun rises in Yosemite, if you've been out there, there's the whole kind of rock cliff face here, El Capitan. The sun's first rays fall on this one section of the rock they call the dawn wall. I mean, dawn, the dawn's light, this is what takes the, the, uh, the first rays. And it's kind of a mecca for rock climbers out there, but this one particular aspect of, of the granite out there, it's 3,000 feet, it's a sheer face. They're, it's almost smooth as glass. Well, in 2015, these, these two guys attempted and succeeded in climbing it. And there is a great long story, there's some, a movie made about it. But for our, for our retreat this morning, from the naked eye, at the first glance, you see this rock wall that is simply, simply smooth. There's, there's nothing there to hold on to. But in the light of the early morning sun, if you stay there, you begin to notice little flakes of granite, little, little chips, little pockets where you can put a finger or a towel. And the same thing for us in, in faith is that sometimes we can look at something and say, you know what, there's nothing there. But as we allow the dawn, Jesus, to shed his light upon something in my life that maybe I have written off. I've either written off something about myself or about someone else. And I look at it long enough, I begin to see, oh, there's flakes of grace there. I can hold on to that. I can ascend the mountain to God on these flakes of grace. And just to notice, you know, if we're in prayer there, Sometimes this happens. Nothing's happening to me in prayer. Nothing's going on. Just pause. Hit the brakes. Jesus, you are the light of the world. It can't be just pure, smooth granite here in my heart. There are contours here in my heart. The contours of the heart, for, you know, everyone here grew up with record players, right? You know, 45, 73, 78, all of that. It's great. You know what I'm talking about here. You know, a record to, you know, to naked eye, and if you just look at it, it's a nice, smooth kind of piece of vinyl. You just glance at it. But then you put it on the turntable, on the needle. And I was recently in uh, a record shop where they had a reissued album from the the early 70s, so one of my favorite bands. I put the headphones on, it's just majestic to hear the old record, because you hear conduits of the sound that you don't hear. But that's what it's like, we stay with it. In the light of Jesus, what we think is just smooth and nothing's there, it begins to reveal the contours. You know how the needle on the record goes over those small contours, all of sound is produced there. And what looks smooth actually produces something very melodious. The same thing with the light of Christ, as he's looking upon us, and if we don't flinch and move away, something melodious is produced in there. The contours of our hearts make a sound, we call that prayer. So the sunlight revealed these flakes of rock, these hands, these handholds and toes. They, they climb this, this sheer face. So to think about this, areas of sheer, sheer cliff that I have 
possibly written off. Maybe we say this about ourselves or to other people. I'll never get past this in my life. I'll never get over it. This hurt, this anger, this suffering, whatever it is. Or it's always the same with me. Things always turn out the same. That's when we want to just get pause. Jesus, you are the light of the world. Shine on the contours of my heart. Let me hear the prayer that's really here. You remember um, flakes, speaking of flakes of grace. Now, for people that are not from Chicago, you might not get the reference here. But on Christmas Eve night, this is about three years ago, I was on faculty still at the seminary. And the seminary is a giant campus. The, the students are gone during Christmas, and most of the faculty take off too. And I was there, and I think honestly, in a 200 room building, I was the only person there and for several days. It was just, it was not eerie, but it was just like, there is no one here. Um, I think I was going out later to visit my parents after Christmas. But on Christmas Eve night, I had the 6 p.m. evening mass at the parish that I helped out at. I drove to the parish, it's about 20 minutes away. Then I had the, the 7 a.m. mass the next morning. So 6 p.m. mass, I kind of had it already set. Um, 6 p.m. mass, I'm come back, you know, like after mass, I'm chicken pot pie, maybe can get a, a movie and, and call it good. You know, a real winner of a Christmas Eve night. <laughs> But, you know, it, there's like a, mel- I'm a little melancholic personality at times, and I, that's, I was resolved that's the way it was going to be, me and the seminary. So I go and say Mass, and there's this guy in front row with his wife and his four kids, and this guy, Dave, he's younger than I am, and he's, he is a truck driver. He's kind of a rough and tumble guy, but he was always at Mass with his, with his family there. And, uh, out of the narthex after mass, you know, great people say Merry Christmas. And Dave comes up to me and he said, Hey, Father, why don't you come over to the house after, after mass? You know, we're having beef sandwiches. We're going to have some uh, more of my family over. I'm like, I don't know, Dave. I, I just, I, I really don't think so. I think I'm kind of good for tonight. And, uh, if Dave would take no for an answer, he kind of grabs me by the neck and shakes me. He goes, he goes my father, we've got a charter there. And uh, for those not from Chicago, you don't get it, but that's what we put on these sandwiches. And I said, Dave, you got me a charter there. <laughs> so the flake of grace was you know what? I've kind of written off the night already. Kind of feeling sorry for myself in the seminary, on faculty, no one's around. I got my pot pie waiting to wait to sit in the movie. But then here's this way of grace out of nowhere a family, beef sandwiches at Christmas Eve night. So I went over there and it, fantastic. I didn't say long, it was great though. I mean, just an uplifting experience. These little place rock. And if it wasn't through his persistence in the Jardinera, I would have had a hot body. <laughs> and not been telling the story. So, it's a slight turn of the will. Sometimes when we write things off in our life, we think we have to, where is God in all of this? It's like using a compass and you're one degree off. You just, it's just one little tick mark. Just a slight turn back to God. It's not a big turn. We don't have to turn around. No, I am slightly on course here. Oh, I'm going to face you now. It's a slight turn to face God in prayer. Notice, again, the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Things that we wake up with that are on our heart and mind. And maybe you're not like me, but I often have the same instinct or feeling that I wake up with. There, it's just... It's always there at some level. Like, oh, there's a lot on my plate today. Not feeling sorry for myself, but like this little subtle, subtle agitation or anxiety. And I just thought, okay, this is the way things are. Wait a second, why don't I just turn to the Lord at the beginning of the day and tell him about it? 
And it can set the tenor of the rest of the day. The same thing with the end of the day. Lord, you know what happened in my day today, and things that I don't even know what happened, but you do. I turn to you at the end of the day, and I say my, my end of the evening prayers. Turn to page four. Jesus had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired from the journey, sat down there at the well. It was about noon. So again, where do we defensively go? Or what are the barriers that we place up in our life that Jesus wants to move through and speak to us? the very person that we are. I've got a, per, uh, a friend, and he said, you know, my brother-in-law is a great guy. But, and my friend said, he's like, Brian, do you know what a yak is? And I'm like, I kind of know what a yak is. I can't, I can kind of picture it. But, it's this big furry animal. I think it's like an elephant, if I'm not mistaken, but I'll have to look it up. But a yak's fur is like 18 inches thick. And he said, you know, if you wanted to touch the yak, you have to really sink in 18 inches of fur before you actually touch that person. There's like this whole barrier of yak fur before you actually get to the yak. <laughs> He's like, that's how my brother-in-law is. He's a great guy, but I'm not actually sure who he is. You gotta get through all this yak fur. We we can do the same thing with ourselves and with other people, certainly, but with the Lord too. Like there can be this this posture that I've got to be a certain way in front of God, and so I have to present myself in a certain way, instead of presenting myself as I really am. So the question, maybe this morning, or for our prayer, what is the as-is situation of your life right now? Not the way that you wish it would be, not the way that it once was, but as-is right now. If we're ever having, having trouble finding a place to start in prayer, What's the as is situation of my life right now? And just reveal that to God in your prayer. Then the act for is taken care of. It's no longer there. This is who I am. This is the as is situation of me right now. And it can, it can develop into this beautiful, just honest dialogue between, uh, between you and God. You want, to, you want to talk about honest dialogue? I assume there's probably some daily mass stories here, right? So you probably went to mass. Maybe if you went to mass yesterday, you heard the end of Jonah's uh, travail, right, with God. And uh, Nineveh was not destroyed, and Jonah's upset about that. God has mercy on Nineveh. But then God says to Jonah, uh, do you have reason to be angry with me? God said that to John, do you have reason to be angry with me? If God said that to me, I'd probably say, no, all good. <laughs> it's kind of like I'm a kid that never grows up. And like my mom, something wrong with me? No, no, fine, fine. But John doesn't do that. John is honest. Yeah, I have reason to be angry, angry enough to die. Now, what would it be like, and we're probably already here, but just to be, just to be honest with God with the situation that we're all in, as is, and to speak to him as Moses did, as one friend to another. I've got a cousin who's a priest, 
in uh, the Diocese of Joliet. And we are extremely close, very close. In, in fact, my mom and his mom are sisters, we're first cousins, but we're cut from a lot of the same cloth. And I cannot fool him. And so we'll be talking on the phone, and, and he can sense it a mile away, like, what's really going on? Like, and he'll say it more, you know, brotherly jiving language than that. <laughs> but he, he knows me well enough. Just get it out. Tell me what's really going on. To do that with the Lord in our prayer, that's where the intimacy grows. What I found, especially with my cousin and other good friends of mine, I actually look forward more to the conversation when there is that honest dialogue at the level of friendship. Because then I know there's no yak for it there. We're getting a real person. I'm lighting fires in a late location. Someone came up to me. I can't remember your name, excuse me, but she, she gave me great insight. What about lighting fires in the rain? I'll, I'll, I'll explore that one. It probably is possible. It's easy to light a fire. See, there's a quote uh, about St. Ignatius of Loyola. There's someone who wrote a biography on him. It's one of the points here on lighting fires in the rain location. The biographer said that St. Ignatius did not complain about the darkness of the age, but lit small lights everywhere. You know, Ignatius lived in the, in the mid 1500s. If there was a darkness of the age there, there is certainly a darkness of the age that we're living in. But what would it be like for us not to complain about the darkness of the age once we set that aside and said, you know what, I'm just going to light small lights everywhere. Small ones. And go about that. Got a friend, um, Father Matt, he was a pastor in the, uh, in the city of Chicago. And this is about 15 years ago. I was at his uh, parish. I was getting together with him on a Friday night. And it was, the, it was February, it's early February, it's February 2nd, the Feast of Presentation. And it literally, literally was zero degrees out this night. And he said, okay, uh, he said, hey, Brian, you want to celebrate the Mass? He goes, after Mass, we're going to have a procession in the streets with the Blessed Sacrament. And we're going to visit all the places um, of violence from this past month. He lived in a pretty rough area. That's where the parish was. There were a lot of shootings there. And after Mass, there were about 75 people from the parish, Father Matt, myself, another priest, 75 people on a zero degree Friday evening. And we were out for about 90 minutes. We went to every place in the neighborhood, apartment building, other places, said a little prayer, blessed the, with the monstrance, that the building or whatever. And we're walking down one of the major streets in the city and there was this little pizzeria shop where there had been a uh, shooting just a couple days before and someone died there. And I said, oh wow, we're going to stop there. We didn't stop there. We went in. And here's Father Man with 75 of us. We walk in the front door with the Blessed Sacrament. And it's a very Catholic neighborhood. And it was like, you could see the cook behind the counter turned on the radio. Some people in their, in their booths got on their knees. They, they knew other people were like, what is going on? We walked in there and said a prayer. And we walked out the side door. And I just remember the witness, the, uh, the boldness of, of his witness, but also um, not getting into, into arguments with people, but the small light that can be lit. I don't know who was lit on fire that day. My heart is... is retained that fire for 15 years. And what my friend Father Matt said, I said, did the owner know that he would come in into the pizza shop? He said, he said, no, but the Lord doesn't need to come in and, and make an appointment or announce his presence beforehand. He just shows up to places of suffering. And I thought, 
Okay, I'm going to keep that in my pocket. That was beautiful. There was this priest out in Omaha. Uh, he was out in the country, and he, he there was a farmer out there that he was trying to get to know. And this, this priest would try to go on the combine during the fall with these different farmers just to get to know them. And this one gentleman, he, he was taking months. He couldn't set it, the, the schedules didn't line up. But finally, one day, he's out, let's call it October. Uh, he was out of the combine. I think it's how he gets combine season. When I hear combine season, I think they had a belt. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, but out in Omaha, I'm learning about the combines. So we out there, they had a great conversation. Two days later, um, the local sheriff shows up at this priest's rectory and said, you know, we found uh, you know, John Rutherford, the farmer, we found him, he had a heart attack in the combine, and uh, he died. And we haven't notified the family yet, but we found your business card in, in the combine. Could you go with us to notify the family? And so we did. But then what I thought was beautiful, a little light that he lit, and the wake, he had business cards with his name and his picture, and he handed them out to every, all the farmers of the wake. And he, um, even if they're Catholic or not, he said to the people at the wake, he said, I'm, I'm here for you. I, I'm the Catholic priest in the area. If you ever need anything, here's my, here's my name and phone number. He just thought that it was a great way just to be, to allow people to know that they're not on their own out there, to light small lights everywhere we go. <clears throat> Another friend of mine, he's a layman. Uh, he was praying. And he was praying about some family issue that he was really concerned about. And uh, he realized that he prays out of his anxiety and his worry. So he turns to Jesus when he's anxious about this family situation and prays. And finally he said one day he was praying and he heard back to him, John, worry is not love. Pray to me out of love. And when he told me that, he started like, I pray out of anxiety and worry all the time. But what's that? It's that slight turn of the will, just a subtle tick mark. I'm going to pray to Jesus out of love, and he's going to take care of what needs to be taken care of. I don't want worry to burn me more than it already does. Okay, Nicodemus, the one who had come to Jesus at night also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing 100 pounds. Just the courage of someone as they, they go through life and are people that are willing to encounter the Lord. There's a courage that stirs up inside of them. You know the story of the He came to Jesus early on. And he's got questions. And Jesus says, you have to be reborn from above. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. What does that mean? He's wrestling with it. And he's there again in midway through the Gospel of John. But then at the end, who is there when Jesus is dead on the cross? There's two people. Okay, Mary is there. And Mary, the wife of Clovis, the women are there. But the last two there to take down Jesus' body, Nicodemus, who brought the 100 pounds of spices, and Joseph of Arimathea. And to think about the courage there that they have to face the authorities, all that stuff, but they've been so impacted by the man Jesus. No, I'm willing to go to Pilate and ask for his body. I'm willing to carry this 100 pound bag of spices to bury him. These are men that have been touched, and women that have been touched by the Lord. And there's a courage, just a subtle courage that rises up inside of them. And to note, where do we draw our strength? Where do we draw our strength from in our lives? I've got two examples here of two bishops, Oscar Romero and Cardinal Newman, and both in their lives, 
It's interesting if you read their biographies, where they drew their strength from. Vishbatsu Romero was martyred in 1980 in El Salvador. He was named the Archbishop of El Salvador, of San Salvador. By all accounts, he was kind of a, a, a very timid, bookish, uh, didn't make waves type of priest. And in 1977, if you remember history, there is you know, it's a government for a lot of the poor people. And one of his friends was, was martyred in a little village, Father Rutilio Grande, very good friend of Oscar Romero's. And Romero, the account was, Romero went to the house because he wanted to see the body of his dead friend. And when he came out, he was a changed person. Something happened to him that simply lit up and awakened inside of him. It was the Lord. And the next three years, you know, he preached courageously uh, the gospel, and he lived a very simple and poor life. And then he was martyred at the altar saying Mass on March 24, 1980. Where did he draw his strength? Most people wrote him off. He's a bookish man. He's a bookish priest. He's an academic. He's timid. But the Lord touched him in a deep way and most people had written him off, but then there was this fire that lit up inside of him. Cardinal Newman, if you remember, he was a bishop in, uh, he was Cardinal in, in England. He started life as an Anglican. So Anglican in England, that's a big thing, but he converted in his 40s to become Catholic. And you know the history of the 1800s, Catholics were not looked upon well in that, in that part of the world. And he was a prominent scholar, and people took him to task in the public media, in the newspapers. And Newman had kind of a depressive uh, personality, and he was already a converted Catholic, and just kind of was living along in a milquetoast kind of way until a real prominent Anglican person, uh, I think his name is Charles Kingsley, took him to task in one of the papers. And it was like a lion woke up inside of Newman. And he just went back down about the Catholic faith after that. He said, no, I'm, I'm not going to take a back seat here. I'm going to write and preach and talk about the Catholic faith. Where do we draw our strength? And I'm not saying that we're in these public arenas, all of us, like Romero and Newman. But in our own way, we have faced places in our life where there might be kind of something quieted down, or we've written it off, or there's a timidity. Allow the Lord to touch that. When people, this is an image from John the Cross about a fire. He said, you know, when people draw close to Jesus in their life, you know how you have a fireplace, a log, it, it, as it's burning, it becomes more and more ash. And you can't tell where the flame stops and the log begins. It becomes one because that log is so so much on fire. It's a white hot log. You know when the log gets to that point. But before that, if it's a wet log, there's a lot of steam and sputtering. And that's why you have the grates on the fireplace. It sparks shoot off. He said that's that's the way our life is with Jesus. In the beginning, there can be moments in areas that are being burned off inside of us. Maybe not simple things, but maybe selfish things. And there's the steam that goes off. There's the spark that goes off. But what this reminded me of is how many people that are going through their own conversions that I run into, and I can write them off. So if I'm in the narthex meeting people after Mass, and maybe someone's in a grumpy mood and they say something to me after my ass and, wow, that, it wasn't that sure. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. But I'm given pause now because, you know what? Maybe they're meeting Jesus in their life in a deep way for the first time, and they're kind of like that wet log. And I just happen to be the person that receives the spark that is shooting off right now. Would it be another person, okay? But, you know, but I think it gives me pause to, to hear people out and to, uh, to consider they may be going through some type of, of conversion deeper to Jesus 
and they've got to let some steam off. They will have uh, a heart that's on fire soon enough. Next page, five. This little quote is from Pope Benedict, before he was Pope Benedict. He was, um, I think he was a cardinal in Germany. But he would often, you know, as a tradition, if you think to a new priest's first mass, often a new priest will have a different, different person, a different priest, preach the homily. So Cardinal Ratzinger had been invited to these masses of young priests you know, in the, in the late 60s and early 70s. And he would often be asked to give the homily. And so there's a compilation of these homilies. And it's one, um, Cardinal Ratzinger, that's Pope Benedict, uh, said this in the middle of his homily. He tells the story about an author, Selma Lagerlof, who's a, I think, a Dutch author. She won the Nobel Prize for Literature in the early 1900s. But Benedict writes this, uh, he says in his homily, Selma Lagerlof recounted in one of her legends the story of a medieval knight, a man full of brutality, severity, and egoism, who one day gets into his head the idea to bring a burning flame from the Holy Land intact to his homeland in northern Italy. And in the self-forgetting service to the slain, which now is the sole law of his path, he himself is changed. For he may no longer look back to what he was, but exclusively look forward, because the flame is the content of his path and of his life. In this service of the other, he becomes free of himself, free from himself, he becomes whole, he becomes mature, he becomes benevolent, he becomes warm. There, for the first time, arises in him what he can truly be. So a man taken up, self-centered, decides to carry his flame across many countries, intact to the Holy Land, from the Holy Land back to Italy. And if you read the tale, he was beaten up by robbers on the way home. He fell asleep one night out in a farm field. The light went out. A farmer came and relit the light. He realized other people were supporting him on the way. A lot of things that he thought were important in his life drifted away, but he wanted to keep his flame alive. It's a great, it's a, it's a tale, it's a fairy tale. But for us, the flame of faith, Jesus had baptism, candles given to the parents and godparents to keep his flame intact the rest of our life. The Sarah Club. Lighting little fires in parishes and in the hearts of young men on the way to priesthood. But to notice what it did to the night, he began to see what he could truly be if he dedicated his life to keeping his flame alive. I always admired John Paul II. He was always moving out toward other people. He, the plane would land, he'd kiss the ground, whatever country he went into. And then he'd move out and he'd greet people. He was always moving out to people. There was, a, there was a man where the flame touched his heart and he knew who he could truly be. On the Eucharist, we could spend, you know, the rest of our life on the Eucharist here. John chapter 1, from the beginning, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. My heart is moved with pity for the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will collapse on the way. And some of them had come a great distance. Disciples, where can we get enough bread to satisfy them here in this deserted place? Can you hear the disciples writing off? It's like a smooth dawn wall. Now we've written this off. It's a deserted place. There's no food here. Jesus is here. How many loaves do you have? Five, two fish. Bring them to me. 
I remember Cardinal George, he was the Archbishop of Chicago. He ordained me here. He died in 2015. I was the vocation director, and I would often gather uh, some young men, some guys who were considering the priesthood, would have a dinner maybe twice a year with Cardinal George. And he would always be peppered with questions. Guys would ask him this, that, the other thing. He asked about his favorite baseball team, where he grew up, all the things. But then they asked him about his prayer life one time. And I always found that interesting. I'm like, my, my ears perked up. And he said he had a devotion to the Eucharist uh, since he was from his first communion onward. He always had a real strong devotion to the Eucharist. But then he said this. He said, you know, right after Mass, after you receive the Lord in communion, you can't lie to him. And he didn't mean this at, in some way like in the negative. He meant it in the positive, meaning at that moment, speak what you want to him because he's as close to you as he's going to be. You can't lie to him because he's right there in person. And I always remember that after Mass. And I don't do it as well as the Cardinal did, but to give people some, some space, silence, so they can just speak to Jesus in truth and not lie to him. I found when I pray in the morning, I pray in the morning, that's, that's when I have to do it. Wake up, get your coffee, and do my prayer in the morning. But sometimes I don't have the right words. It's like I can't get out of my mind and my mouth like what I really want to say to God. But invariably, after communion, after I received communion, I'm sitting down in the chair, what I was struggling to say to God in the morning is, is there with clarity right after communion. It might not be profound, but it'll be like, oh, this is what I wanted to say to you. I couldn't get it out in the morning in my jumbled early morning fog, but right after communion, this is what I want to say. So just to consider that, speaking to God from the depth of your heart right after communion. How did Jesus interact with the crowds over three days? Notice the scripture passage. My heart is moved with pity for the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. What was the interaction with Jesus? You know, I love speaking for crowds like this, but if I'm thinking about it, you couldn't sit here for three days. You probably can't take three more minutes. I, guess. <laughs> I know. Believe me, I've been out in those chairs too. I know. It's, we're getting to the end here. Jesus was not standing three days speaking to a large crowd of people. There's no way he would have drifted off. What was it like for him to move in and out of the crowds for three days? And is that a model for me and for us? And to sit with a group of family or a group of people or Sarah Club from here or Sarah Club from there, spend time with him. And then Jesus goes on to the next Sarah Club. And then this Sarah Club said, Wow, wasn't that great when he was talking about this? And then Sarah Club A talks to Sarah Club B, what did he talk to you about? And there becomes this fire that is lit because Jesus went from crowd to crowd, family to club to club. He didn't speak like this. He may have at times, but what was it like for him to light fires walking through the people? Again, then, notice at the end of the scripture passage, they have all that, that bread left over the Eucharist. Nothing is discarded. The fragments are gathered up. We don't want to discard anything that's going on in our spiritual lives. If it's not complete yet, don't discard it. Bring it to Jesus. He'll gather it up in some way. Okay, a couple more points, and then we're going to have a few minutes of silence. I already mentioned here, I look at him, he looks at me. The two Russians. This is a very moving uh, story for me, because I, I don't know how the story ended. And I don't know how it began, but I know what they were searching for. But a saint man said parish on a very hot August night uh, about seven years ago. I had just come back from making 
a 30-day silent retreat. So I came back, and I was helping out with the spirit. I had the Saturday evening mass, the pastor was on vacation. And I see the first reading goes, the psalm, the second reading, the gospel is about to be proclaimed. And I see these two women walking into church. And here is me on the mountaintop of a 30-day retreat. Kind of late, ladies. You know, they're already judging me. <laughs> and they're, they're not dressed for the occasion. I mean, it was very summer dress, you know. And uh, so, anyway, there are these two, and I, I forgot all about them. And then coming up uh, at communion time, I see them in line, they come to communion, and they had kind of a fumbled hand gesture receiving on the hand. It wasn't quite, they didn't quite posture themselves to receive on the tongue, but their hands weren't like most people are taught. And okay, fine, whatever. Communion goes on. After Mass, I'm walking out in the narthex, and I see one of the sacristans who's been in the parish from the very founding. And she said, uh, Father, this one lady, she didn't receive communion right. She was walking back uh, the aisle with her, and I told her she had to consume it. I'm like, okay, okay. So I'm like, okay, what am I going to do here? And so everyone leaves. Pastor's not here. Why do you the pastor who addresses <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's this lady, young woman, and uh, remarkably, she stayed around for me after getting kind of, you know, I don't know, scolded, but. She said, oh, and she has this thick Russian accent. She said, oh, Father, um, if I do an accent, it's always an Irish accent, so I'm not going to do my Russian accent. <laughs> Father, uh, my friend and I were driving down the road, and we saw the church, and we knew it was a sign of what we were looking for. And we came in, and she said, I know this is not how we receive communion in our church, we do it differently. And I've been thinking about all my theology. Oh, she's Russian Orthodox. So she went to everything we received the Eucharist. I didn't, I didn't make a bad mistake here. So I go, where's your friend at? She goes, oh, she's in tears out in the parking lot. She, she's just uh, all worked up and she didn't receive communion right. She feels bad. Okay. Let's go out in the parking lot. She's not in the parking lot. I've already judged them for coming to the mass. I've judged them for what they're wearing or not wearing. Very, you know, summery. And on the time line, this woman's crying, and she's got this thick Ukrainian accent. I'm not an accent specialist, but she mentioned she's from Ukraine. So I'm thinking to myself, seven years ago, a lot of turmoil in Ukraine. People were fleeing again in Ukraine. I don't know what was going on, but she said the same thing. She was, Father, we're in a very tough situation in our life. We saw this church. We stopped. We had to come in. I know we don't receive communion like this in our church, and we won't do it again, but we felt that we needed to receive communion. And I just, just was welled up by what was going on there. But what was the most, uh, and then we, they said, you know, why don't we pray together right now? We prayed, and the, the Russian woman, not the Ukrainian, she said, Father, can you give us your blessing? And I gave a blessing. And then she said, this has been the best thing that has happened to us today. I said, okay, you didn't know that I was judging you in my mind. <laughs> you were apprehended by the pillar of the parish. Your friends in tears here. And you have the, the, the charity to say this is the best thing that's happened to you today. And then they leave, and I don't know I've never seen them again. They never came back to the parish. But I'm driving home, and tears are running down this priest's face. What were they involved in? I don't know. But they found something in the Lord that touched them deeply. And they touched me deeply. And I will pray for them today for the blessed sacrament. I don't know where they are or whatever happened in their lives, but it was very... Um, just moving experience of how people are touched by Jesus in their life. Okay, that's enough of me. So, why don't we just take 
five minutes in silence, okay? Five minutes can seem interminable, but how about this? We'll just spend just a few minutes in silence. And when we present in our hearts the as-is situation of your life right now, and just in silence, speak to the Lord. And then, when five minutes are up, I'm going to start the Tantum Ergo. We'll say that. We'll do a little prayer for a benediction. I'll bless you, and then we'll do the Holy God, like in the divine grace that we normally do. Okay? So, I'll keep a close watch, maybe five minutes.
unto Together in the divine praises. Blessed be God. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God, true God. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be His most great heart. Blessed be His most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus, the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Holy Blessed be the great mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be your holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be your glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, the Virgin Mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, the most Jesus Christ. Blessed be God and his angels in the sea. Thank you. 
Father, we will be returning once he uh, places the blessed sacrament back in the adoration room. So please remain seated. I just uh, wanted to thank everyone this morning. And uh, my pleasure to be here with everyone. It's always great to to, uh, to pray and talk and be together. So uh, thank you for I mean all the support. I know as vocation directors, the Sarah Club uh, supported us, but with uh, IPF, it's been a great support. Sarah International and the local Sarah Club. So I'm very grateful for all of your support over the many years. And I'm only there, you know, 15 months, but Sarah has been supporting IPF for many years. So very grateful for that. And I look forward to, to seeing you after this. And I think Tim's got a word or two here. I think now you know why Omaha is very proud of calling one of our One of the things that we try to do as part of one of our objectives is our own call to holiness. So in Sacramento, California in 2014, we did a retreat as well with Father John Horn King. And and uh, held a retreat there in Sacramento. So having, and he was one of the founders of the Institute of Priests of Formation. So having, having Father here today is very special for us. And Father, as a sign of our appreciation, we'd like to present this to you. Thank you. Thank you. And please join me again in thanking Father for being here. Before we break, I'd like to invite all of you to a very special lunch today. This year, 2021, marks the 70th anniversary of the founding of the Sarah International Foundation. So with that, before we go to our lunch we're, of celebration, we're going to show a new video that we've developed so that the clubs can use this and promoting the Sarah International Foundation through their club representatives. So following the movie, we'll break for lunch. Again, lunch will be right next door to us in the grand ballroom. So with that, John, we'd like to present to you the, the video of the foundation. The Sarah International Foundation was founded in 1951 to assist Sarah in fulfilling its objectives of fostering and promoting vocations in the Catholic Church. Since that time, the Foundation has founded a wide range of programs for the formation and training of priests and consecrated religious throughout the world. The Sarah International Foundation puts our mission into action. Organizations throughout the world have benefited from the generosity of our donors. In Pakistan, the Catholic Diocese of Malton was able to provide the St. Joseph's Minor Seminary with solar panels. Thanks to this, seminarians can now focus on their mission for the church without interruption. In the city of Annecy, France, the videographer Anne Getz produced a multimedia project titled Pray to Love. The project followed the art and spirituality of an order of nuns through interviews, film, and the creation of unique visual art pieces. By doing so, Getz was able to unify years of footage to create an artistic documentary to share a message of gentleness and humility. 
Jess's work has been featured in Nashville's News 4, as well as the Franklin International Film Festival. Organizations throughout the United States have benefited from the partnership of our donors. In Los Angeles, the Carmelite Sisters of the Most Sacred Heart utilized their grant to travel to universities across the country, meeting one-on-one -on -one with young women to serve the possible vocation. Over 50 women joined the outreach program. In Connecticut, the Diocese of Bridgeport was able to fund their St. Andrew's Dinner Program, which has provided young men the opportunity to learn more about the Diocesan Seminary Program from their local clergy over a shared meal. Last year, over 45 people were in attendance, and according to the Vocations Office database, potential candidates have increased by 39 new prospects. By supporting the cultivation of vocations, the Sarah International Foundation fulfills its goal to live as an organization dedicated to those programs that bring to us the holy men and women who are the successors to those who follow Jesus. In this way, it has quietly maintained its focus on serving you, your families, and all Catholics. So as part of that gratitude to you, the Sarah and I International Foundation is sponsoring our lunch today. So let's go celebrate it.